how do you find the current situation of the war in Ukraine? We've seen some clips, some pictures from these young people that they're sending to the battlefield. Nima, it is very sad indeed. Um, and I have to tell you that the U.S. is responsible for its continuation. Now, um, last July, Joe Biden was advised and said publicly, Putin has already lost the war. <laughs> His CIA chief said the inefficiency and the uh, the defeat of the Russian army has been laid bare for all to see. Now, what are we to make of that? Well, let's say they weren't just deliberately lying, but they were living in a in a dream world, a dream world occasioned and enabled by the notion that the U.S. is still the exceptional country in the world. It can work its will because we are the USA. I think Biden truly believes that. I have evidence that even in private conversations, he said that. He's even mentioned Madeleine Albright, the infamous Secretary of State from Bill Clinton, who said we are indispensable, not only exceptional. Now, if you're the indispensable country in the world and you believe that, um, then you, you cannot face reality. And reality is that there is nothing that can stop the trajectory of the war in Ukraine, uh, Russia is all about one, and it can, my military advisor friends tell me, within a couple of weeks, if they so choose, reach the Dnieper River and uh, divide Ukraine in half. I, I don't think Putin's going to do that. He doesn't have to do that, okay? But he has the capability. So that's the that's the situation on the ground. The fact that Russia and China are glued at the hip now, that they have a, an alliance that they both describe as exceeding all other alliances, has no end. They don't say it's a military alliance. My friends, it is. And when you see U.S. Marines on Taiwanese islands much closer to China, where on a clear day you can see China exercising and training Taiwanese troops. Well, that's one symptom of how China looks at its interests as being endangered, just as Russia has. So this is what I'd like to, this is fresh, uh, right? Fresh off the press, as we used to say. Uh, Foreign Secretary, uh, Sergei Lavrov uh, of Russia uh, wrote uh, or had an interview with Izvestia, uh, which is one of the main newspapers in Russia still. And uh, I caught wind of this. And actually, they helped me out by having a, I didn't have to go through the Russian. They have a, a, an English translation that the foreign ministry put out. Uh, this is unusual. You know, you could give interviews. But when your foreign minister said, now, please, I'm putting this out in English. You people who speak English, would you please read this? OK. And here's what it says. It's really, really interesting. He's talking about what's necessary in Ukraine. Getting back to your original question. Sorry for the diversion. But I want to set the context here. Um, so Russia is winning. Uh, does Putin want to smash the rest of Ukraine? I don't think so. Does he want to go to the Dnieper? I am one of the few that does not think so. Why? Look at the map. You know, look at the map. Would they want to be responsible for the entire Ukrainian territory up to the Dnieper? I don't think so. I mean, you, you want to have a Vietnam, you have insurgents all over. But I don't think he wants that. So what I think he wants is for people to come to their senses, stop thinking they're exceptional and negotiate. So here's what Lavrov says. China has a proposal. They want to mediate an agreement that takes into account Russian interests. Whoa. 
including lifting sanctions against Russia, which also means the sanctions that were put in place even before the conflict. These principles can be discussed only by people taking their places at the table, at the negotiating table. But this should be done not in terms of the, quote, peace formula, end quote, that Zelensky and his bosses in Europe, London, and Washington have long been pursuing as an ultimatum. If you look at those peace proposals, you'll see that they're quite eccentric, sort of like their author, Zelensky. Now, Lavrov pointed out that when China published its 12-item gradual plan on settling the conflict in Ukraine, uh, we, the Russians, reacted, reacted positively to it. The Chinese document was based on the analysis of the reasons for the events. The reasons, i try to give you some background. And let's see, and the need to remove them. The, re the need to remove the threat to Russia from Ukraine, offensive strike missiles, bombing uh, Donbass, Nazis in Kiev, the whole schmear, okay? So he says this is very distinct from uh, Vladimir Zelensky's, what he calls, Lavrov calls, diplomatically insane formula. And finally, here's Lavrov. And this is, appears in Izvestia, which is read in Russian as it was not read in Russian during the Soviet period because everybody knew it was just propaganda from the Kremlin. Now it's read because it's, because it's ordained by the president whom 87% of the Russian people voted and even more important, 77% of the Russian people came out and voted, okay? Even knowing that this was a done deal that, that, that Putin would win, okay? So here, here it is. Isvestia Lavrov. Let's hypo hy hypothetically fantasize, fantasize that Ukraine is back to its 1991 borders. Look up online what Ukrainian politicians and parliamentarians have been saying about their plans for the people who now live in Crimea, in Luhansk, and Donetsk provinces, and in Zaporozhye and in Kherson Oblast. Now, those are the four that have voted to uh, in a plebiscite in plebiscites to join Russia. Okay, what they are calling for does not even sound like a cleansing. Okay. There is one lady in the in the Verkhovnaya Rada, the Ukrainian Parliament, who said that twenty five thousand people in Crimea, in Crimea should be executed for show. If this formula, if if this is what Zelensky's formula is about, it is an invitation to genocide period, end quote. Now, I mean, that stands on its face, but there's a lot more to this, Nima, because I was wrong back in early February 2022 because I didn't think that Putin would invade Ukraine. I saw the problems that he had I thought that he could handle us in a different way, uh, but I didn't know one crucial aspect, and it has to do with China. Now, I was assiduous in consulting with all, all the Chinese experts I once knew, the ones that aren't dead yet, <laughs> And they all assured me, look, China would never support a, a Russian invasion of, of, 
of great. It's against their core principle. The best failure, for God's sake, no violation of international borders, no fooling around in the internal affairs of the country. Come on, China would never bless that. So McGovern says to himself, okay, would Putin do this alone? I don't think so. And so that was way out on a limb. I said, look, you know, yeah, there are lots of troops on the border, but I don't think Putin's going to do this. I think he's going to try to get those people at Geneva to start talking and to accommodate some of his problems, despite the bad blood before. Well, I was wrong. Now, why was I wrong? Well, I should have figured out that when Putin talked to Xi Jinping in Beijing on the 4th of February, 2022, okay, so several weeks before the invasion, that he presented the problem to Xi Jinping. He said, look, we're being threatened. Our core interests are being threatened in Ukraine, just like yours are being threatened in Taiwan. I mean, did you know, you probably know Xi Jinping, that there are Marines right there that would see China from where they are in those little islands, you know? And so uh, I don't know how to tell you this, um, Xi Jinping, but me, Putin, I've decided that I have to stop this, to stop the killing of my Russian compatriots in Donbass, stop the employment of medium-range ballistic missiles in Ukraine. The Americans have reneged on an undertaking that they would not do that. So I just want to let you know um, that I, I'm going to have to probably do a special military operation in Ukraine, if only to, to scare the hell out of Zelensky and get him to stop this stuff, okay? What do you think? Now, I wasn't a fly on the wall there either, but I could see Xi Jinping saying this. I understand. But you're not going to do this before the Olympics are over, are you? <laughs> yes. Putin, oh, no, no, no. We're launching the Olympics today on the 4th of February. When are they over? Oh, they're over on the 20th. Okay. Nothing more said. So what happens? On or about the 20th, Donetsk and Lugansk declare their independence. Russia says that, okay, we recognize your independence and we form a military a defense treaty with you. It's all approved by the Russian uh, Duma. And a couple of days later, the invasion of Ukraine on the 24th of February. Now, I mean... <sighs> The chronology is really interesting. I'm not arguing that it was uh, propter hoc, er <laughs> post hoc ergo propter hoc, the fallacy where just because something happens after something that is on account of something. But I think it's, it's a really interesting to see. And I find myself a little bit excused in thinking, as all my Chinese specialists thought, that, that China would never approve this. They did approve it. It's very clear. They have never criticized it. Did some somebody asked the Chinese ambassador one time, did you approve that? Of course, the Chinese ambassador said, of course not. No, we wouldn't approve that. But of course they did. And it's very clear that, you know, it's really interesting, Lima. We criminologists, uh, we pay real, real close attention to the wording of official pronouncements, okay? And guess what happened to the wording of Chinese official pronouncements. Westphalia? Well, we put that Westphalia on the back burner. The Chinese started saying, we look at these kinds of situations on their own merits. We think primary, primarily one has to defend one's core interests. Whoa. Now, they, with that kind of major change in public policy or propaganda, at least, open statements, public uh, 
policy statements, that's significant. It always has been. People don't realize that now, but it is. Now, lately, they've been saying a lot more was failure, but those were the key weeks and months that they kept saying, well, a, a country's got to do what it's got to do to defend its core interests. So what I'm saying here now is that I have a special... I have a special claim on some expertise on Russia-China relations because my first job as an analyst in the CIA was to evaluate how Russia was looking at China. There were all people, all kinds of people saying, ah, they're both commies, they're both communist nations. Oh, yeah, they have propaganda one against the other. That's just a deception. Their interests are all the same. And, you know, push comes to shove. They're together. And what am I watching? I'm watching not only this acrid, acrid verbal dispute, but I'm watching the Chinese and the Russians shoot at each other across their river border, borders in Siberia. I'm watching each side subvert foreign communist parties by factionalism and all kinds of stuff. And finally, I'm watching Kissinger and Nixon saying, is this real? Is this, this dispute real? And we are able to say, yeah, take it to the bank. It's real. Can we exploit it? We would say, that's up to you, but it's real, okay? We don't propose policy. Now, it was exploited. And sort of as a personal reward, I got to go to Moscow. I had been chief of the Soviet foreign policy branch, advising the negotiators as to whether the Russians were serious. And one of the reasons they were serious about arms control was they didn't want the Chinese to steal a march on them in improving relations with the U.S. They didn't want two against one, okay? And it looked like with Kissinger just having... <laughs> Kissinger and Nixon just having gone to China, there was a danger. So we told them all that. We said, this little play that you're, is working, okay? The Soviets are really interested. And the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty was signed there. I was there at the time. It was a blessing beyond compare. It made the strategic situation stable for 30 years. Mark them. 1972 to when George... W. Bush got out of that treaty in 2002, okay? You can look it up. It just guaranteed that neither side could expect to do a first strike on the other without expecting immediate and devastating retaliation, okay? So what am I saying here? I'm saying that I come from this experience where they were at loggerheads, okay? And we told Kissinger and Nixon, I can show you the memo. It's not classified. We said, look, you know, this is for real. It's really exploitable, but we don't know how long it's going to last. Uh, they are sacrificing so much equities in their international situation that we expect in time that more sensible leadership will come into both Beijing and into Moscow. So, you know, it's not going to, you know, we can't say forever, okay? It's not a forever stamp, so to speak. And we were not quite sure about that, but we thought we ought to alert that. Well, gradually, even before I left active duty with the CIA, we were seeing signs of rapprochement. We were seeing signs that there were more enlightened leaders, Joe and Lai and others, and more in, in, in Russia as well, that were saying, you know, this is crazy. This is giving us a handicap, which we don't need to have. And long story short, when Putin came into power, 2000, okay, he made it a point, because he's a very adroit politician, of developing very close relations with not only Xi Jinping, but his predecessors. I think with Xi Jinping, they've, they've met either personally or virtually like 35 times so far, okay? That means something, okay? They have a bond now. As I mentioned, they have this, this statement of strategic togetherness, which is all but a mutual 
Defense Treaty. And uh, I've been saying now for years that if the if the bomb goes up or if the flag goes up, if there's real active tensions between NATO and Russia in Europe, there will be a lot of sword waving, a lot of a lot of Chinese warnings and worse uh, in in the far China Sea in the East China Sea and against Taiwan. And God knows what will happen in the Red Sea, for God's sake, where the Russians have now introduced some warships. Red Sea, you know, you know about Gaza, right? So, so the equation has changed. And maybe the last thing I could mention in this respect, <laughs> now I'm not good at math, but my sons are, and they, I go to them and I say, now, now sons, they're both mathematicians. Uh, when I was watching Sino-Soviet Russia-Chinese relations, the 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 uh, trade the turnover the trade turnover was two hundred million a year. That was nineteen sixty five. Now it's uh, two thousand twenty four, and it's. It's over two hundred billion a year. B billion with a B. So two hundred million, two hundred billion. What kind of what kind of increase is that, sons? <laughs> I said, that's a hundred percent that. I said, I thought so, but I just did confirmation. A hundred a thousand percent, whatever it is. <laughs> I screwed it up again. It's a big deal, okay? Two hundred million, two hundred billion. So they're joined at the hip as never before. That is what the, the old Russians used to call the correlation of international forces. It's the cardinal principle in international relations. John Mearsheimer calls it international relations 101, the balance of power. It shifted markedly against the United States. The only danger is that with a president who's got hardened arteries up here, I'm convinced, and still believes that the U.S. is the exceptional or the indispensable country in the world, which he says privately as well as publicly. And with these acolytes, these acolytes who are either afraid or, or too dumb to tell him, look, Mr. President, things have changed. 200 million to 200 billion... <laughs> <laughs> big chain. And, you know, we're no longer the master of all we survey. Uh, we got to face facts. And uh, we got to go to negotiations in Ukraine because you are not going to be able to prevent a definitive defeat in Ukraine before the upcoming election. And if we lose in Ukraine, if it's made obvious that we've lost in Ukraine, you're going to lose the election, and us too. <laughs> and what's going to happen to us if that orange-haired guy comes in? So think about that, Mr. President. Now, what will they suggest? I've mentioned before that my fear, my fear, and it's a well-founded fear, is that given the personal stakes that these people have in it, and given the only way they could prevent the Russians from prevailing in Ukraine, they will say, Mr. President, we have these low yield nuclear things that we can use and stop the Russians until November. Will they do that? You know, I don't know. I pray and I hope not. But the fact that I suggest that turns the hair up on the back of my neck straight up. OK, so that's where Ukraine lies now. Um, it looks like uh, this is Lavrov's last little pitch to say, look, we are indeed ready to negotiate, but not on what he calls this crazy, I forget the adjectives he's using, but sumashetsi is the, the Russian word. It means literally, shetsi is to, to walk, um is your mind out. So you're walking, you're walking right out of your mind. 
And that's how they look at Mr. Biden right now. That's a very, very delicate, very volatile situation. And, you know, um, if Putin, if I put myself in Putin's shoes and I have those same military advisors, those military generals like Khrushchev did, breathing down his back, you know, I'm, I'm going to say, wow, um, who, whom do I listen to? And they'll say, Mr. Putin, Mr. President, you can listen to your intelligence analysts, if you wish. They deal in things like probabilities, intentions, what the U.S. might prompt NATO or might allow France to do now, for God's sake. We, we generals, we admirals, we look at capabilities, okay? Not intentions. We just want to tell you that the capabilities are there. As a matter of fact, we exceed the U.S. capabilities in certain areas like hypersonic weapons. We don't want to use them, but we're on high alert. And if you, you put us into action, we're ready. And Putin himself has said our people are well prepared to deal with whatever comes down the pipe. So what am I saying here? I've been around for, well, professionally for six decades watching Russia. I've never seen the situation so labile, as the Germans say, uh, delicate, so itsy-kitsy. And I just pray that uh, we'll come out of this without without uh, any major conflagration, because the odds are against this now. Whereas we used to talk about a triangular relationship. If you recall, Nima, you, you have Russia and China and the US equilateral sort of, that's the way it used to be, okay? Now it's isosceles with Russia and China the long ends and the U.S. with the short end of the stick, I dare say, China having developed mighty, mighty um, strategic weaponry. And not only that, but North Korea as well. And sometime, some other occasion, we could talk about the new ICBM that Russia has given North Korea. It's more devastating than anything they had before. And I am really surprised again. You know, honest people admit to being surprised, okay? I'm surprised again that the Russians would give the North Koreans such a such an advanced missile with all kinds of shaft and all kinds of decoys and the ability to reach any place in the United States and the ability to avoid detection because it's mobile, solid-fueled missile, my God. So North Korea has that now, too. An earnest, I guess, of, of how strongly Putin and the Russians feel about needing not only Chinese support here, but a genuine threat from North Korea. Right now in the West, they're talking about Taurus missiles and F-16s. Both of them are capable of carrying nuclear bombs. If they send them to Ukraine and Ukraine start to use them, Russia has no way to verify if they're using with nuclear bombs or without nuclear bombs. And that would be an escalation for this conflict. Do you think that at the end of the day, the West, the Biden administration would send these weapons? You've raised the $64 question. Okay. Now, let's take the 16s first. Do you remember? Do you remember last year when, after several, I think it was six or seven or eight months, Bakhmut fell to the Russians? Heavily defended, incredible losses on the Ukrainian side. A heavily defended Bakhmut fell. Where was Mr. Uh, where was Mr. Biden at that time? If memory serves, he was out in the Far East at some sort of conclave, okay? Who came to see him? Zelensky. Zelensky shows up and he says, Mr. President Biden, I, I don't know how to tell you this, but we've lost Bakhmut. 
Biden says, no problem. Next day, he gets up before the microphones and he says, we're going to give F-16s to Ukraine. Now, I haven't been able to find out, not just yet, who Biden had with him at the, in this Asian capital. Uh, it was probably just Sullivan and or Blinken. Did either of them or the three of them ask for some military advice about F-16s? I don't think there was time to do that. So what we have is a knee-jerk, spontaneous reaction. Okay, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it, Zelensky. You're still our guy, and we still got weapons because we're the exceptional country in the world. We got F-16s. <laughs> but nobody told, well, maybe they did tell them. But what they should have told them is, look, F-16s are several decades old. Uh, we The Russians have several several fighter bombers um, more adroit and more successful than they uh, and you know, the only thing about x-16s is that they can carry nuclear payloads well now is that a good thing oh not as far as the russians are concerned nuclear payloads but Biden said, that's okay. Let's give F-16s to the Ukrainians. Well, would the Dutch give them some? Would the would would the Danes give them some? How, how do you get some F-16s into Ukraine? Okay. Now, what the Russians have said from the outset is we won't be able to know whether these F-16s are armed with nuclear weapons or are not armed with nuclear weapons. Therefore, they will very be they will be very short lived. <laughs> they will not last very long because we have the the capability to shoot them down and also to shoot the airfields from which they would dare to fly. Now, um, what about the F-16s? Well, I think they're supposed to be on their way. Um, Ukrainians have been sort of trained in a very compressed time frame, not knowing very good English somewhere to fly these things. Would they be a match for Soviet air defense and Soviet aircraft? The answer is universal no. They would be a provocation and indeed, the Russians would be able to shoot them down as soon as they left whatever airfield they left, okay? On the on the supposition that these people, these people, these aircraft can carry nuclear weapons. So they warned about that. And yet these uh, allies, so-called, these, these vassal states said, well, Mr. Biden, you want us to give them F-16s? Sure, well, well, of course we'll give them F-16. Now, I don't think there are any F-16s there. I think Putin, well, I don't think, I know that the Russians have already begun destroying the likely airfields that could accommodate F-16s. So where does that leave us? F-16s in Romania? Poland? Where would they be? And what would happen to the airfields in Romania and Poland if these F-16s went over Ukraine and attack Russian forces. Well, leave that to your imagination, but that's how delicate this is. That's what I mean by labile. It's really, really pretty problematical. So now you mentioned the Taurus missiles as well. Now they can, now the Germans don't have, they don't possess nuclear warheads, but there are nuclear warheads in Germany. We know that that's openly acknowledged, okay? So how long it would take to get um, to get nuclear warheads you know into these Taurus missiles is anybody's guess probably not very long. But would the Russians observe this? Likely they would, okay? But they have to plan on the likelihood that they might not. So what happens when these Taurus missiles go up onto the uh, up into the air. Well, they get shot down too. Why? Because they are nuclear capable. 
So when we get those two German or those four German Luftwaffe Air Force officers talking about this uh, in a kind of leisurely way, like, well, you know, they could take out the Crimean bridge there, the bridge over the Kerch Strait, or maybe we could hit ammo dumps within Russia, you know. Uh, just give just give uh, a defense minister Pistorius a uh, full briefing on this. And then, well, that, of course, came to light. And now Holz, uh, the chancellor of Germany, is saying, no, we're not going to we're not going to give them Taurus missiles. And, well, that's a good thing, if true. Well, there's one other thing, and it also has to do with nuclear stuff. And that is these French that <laughs> uh, Macron. Uh, talk about Suma he says, hey, we, we, we might put 2,000 French troops in Ukraine. Now, what would that mean? Well, that would mean that a army of a country, part of NATO, would go into Ukraine and almost certainly, as the Russians have already warned, be obliterated because the Russians have this air surveillance, satellite surveillance that won't quit, they'd be observed and they would be destroyed. So what happens then? Do the French and the Baltic republics and Poland say, ah, the Russians have struck NATO troops. Look, they've just destroyed French troops in Ukraine. We have to invoke Article 5. We're in war with Russia. Will that happen? We wrote a memorandum to the president a week ago. Yeah, a week ago, which we suggested. Mr. President, this is likely to happen. You're going to be asked, you know, whether, whether NATO is now involved. What you need to do, Mr. President, is to tell everybody beforehand. You have to let everybody know, no. The French are doing this on their own hook. If they get attacked, NATO is not automatically involved. You need to make that clear. Okay. Now, wonder of wonders, <laughs> whether the president or his associates read our memo or not, that has been made pretty clear now. So uh, that nuclear threat, you know, that, that had the, the problem of escalating to nuclear war, nuclear war, nuclear exchange. And, you know, what I come back to is I don't know where Biden was when Obama said back in 2015 that, please look at the map. Russia enjoys escalatory dominance in Ukraine. Fancy word of saying they can escalate every step of the way that you can escalate. And so also remember, says Obama, that this is an existential threat for, for Russia. The same kind of missiles along their border as Khrushchev tried to put in Cuba, existential threat, got that? How a great power reacts when, when a great power sees an existential threat? Again, we did it one way. So, Mr. President, uh, please be aware that you're playing with fire here now. And no matter your equities in this election, um, this could get out of hand very, very quickly because the only thing that you have to put in play here is nuclear weapons, however small, okay? But that is the only thing you have to put in play here. And that can, you know, you say you don't want a World War III? Okay. Well, as we, we VIPS told the president in January of last year, you can't have both. Austin says he wants to defeat Russia, a strategic defeat of Russia. Okay. Well, you can't have that without the prospect of a nuclear war. So pick one. Or the other Mr. President, he hasn't done so so far. Let's hope that he's compass mentis enough. Let's hope that his acolytes will not put their personal preferences into play here. 
and the need they feel to win the election and avoid being put in jail by that orange-headed guy, okay, let's hope that, that sanity prevails and that we can get out of this thing without escalation to nuclear weapons. You talk about the negotiations that Lavrov was talking about in this interview with Izvestia. And we know that there is a conference in Switzerland. It seems Russia doesn't intend to take part in this conference. Do you think that without Russia, they can reach any sort of substantial result? Uh, Nima, the answer to that is no. Uh, but the interesting thing is what that betokens. That betokens a, a serious miscalculation on the part of Jake Sullivan, who is the author of these meetings, that we are exceptional and we can convene all these countries and if Russia doesn't want to come or Russia isn't invited, we can get them to come together anyway. He's the author of all this, okay? He started with in the Netherlands several months ago, okay? And the Chinese, I guess, just to kind of see what's going on, they have participated up till now, okay? Now, the Russians have said to the Swiss, hey, Swiss, you still you still pretending to be neutral? Uh, you you're laying the same sanctions on us like everybody else, unprovoked, or ginned up sanctions, and, and you're saying you're neutral. Forget about it. Uh, we're not coming to this stupid thing if it comes off at all. And the Chinese, I think, are saying we're not coming either. I don't know exactly what the Chinese have said, but I, I've seen things that they're not going to show up this time. It's uh, it's crazy. Uh, it's it's sumerschitzi, or as the even stronger word, the, the Germans say, verrückt. You know, it's 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 verrückt. So so what does it you know, what does it say about all these vassals that will come anyway? My God, you know. 75 years after the war, for God's sake, and they're still acting like little puppets. I mean, it shows the caliber of leadership, the hacks that now are in power in Europe. Whereas, you know, three or four decades ago, you had enlightened people like Willy Brandt and Egon Bahr and, and later Schroeder and, and others. Uh, and people who refused to join the war in Vietnam and refused to join the war in Iraq. Now, have they, have they not grown up? Have they recidivated? Are, are they in recidivism? I mean, they've resorted back to be infantile puppets? Well, I think so. It looks that way, but it doesn't really matter anymore because the U.S. Is, is calling the shots and it's the U.S. that needs to be dissuaded if the old Europeans, or the new Europeans can't persuade the U.S. that, uh, look, you know, uh, if this escalates, you know, those air bases and those decision centers that are going to be hit by Putin are not going to be in the United States. They're going to be right here and and, you know, it's bad enough that they might threaten our air bases in France and Germany and you know, Poland. But, you know, they're within range of our of our capitals with hypersonic missiles like six, seven minutes. You know, can't we can't we work things out? Well, you can work things out, but not if you still think you're indispensable and exceptional. You need to go to the bargaining table like Lavrov is suggesting. And I think you will find a very pliable, a very amenable uh, Russia on the other side of that paper uh, with China in support, willing to make certain concessions. Have I said before, Ukraine can't be a viable country without Odessa. Putin, a year and a half ago, suggested that Odessa could be a Yablaka Razdora. It could be a, an apple of discord. You know the implications there. Or it could be a way of resolving differences. I think this is just a guess. I have no direct line to the Kremlin. 
I think the Russians would be, I think the Russians would settle for uh, taking control of Odessa as a as a city ruled by by Russia and some international power, or maybe even Ukraine, if a deal is worked out, so that Ukraine would not end up as a landlocked farm for the rest of Europe, but rather a viable state that would have trade, would have access to the Black Sea. So that's the kind of compromise I think that Putin would still be be willing to envisage, even though he's calling and everybody else is calling uh, Odessa a Russian city. A Russian city. Well, it is a Russian city, but you know that may be a bargaining ploy. Why don't we sit down? Why don't we deal for God's sake uh, before this thing becomes without hope? You talk about Vietnam, how Europeans were in some sort of independence. It seems that there is a direct analogy between what President Lyndon Johnson faced in early 1968 in Vietnam and what Biden faces now in Ukraine. Lyndon Johnson decided to give up on Vietnam War and go after negotiations and not run again for presidential election. How do you see this comparison between these two presidents? The situation is, as you suggest, thoroughly analogous. Uh, LBJ was lied to by the military, by intelligence. I was there. I saw the honest intelligence, for example, saying that communists in the south of Vietnam numbered between 500 and 600,000. The military were saying, no, 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 it could not be more than 299,000. <laughs> we told our chief, the head of the CIA, Richard Holmes at the time, look, not only we, but every other intelligence agency in the U.S. government agrees with us, except the Army, of course, which agrees with Westmoreland. Hello. Okay. So... We did a national intelligence estimate. We wanted to tell Lyndon Johnson this in the summer, August, September, October of 1967, okay? Now, Helms looked at this and said, all right, look, you guys don't understand. I, I see where everyone agrees with you except Westmoreland, but my my job is to protect the CIA, to protect the agency. And there's no way I can protect the agency. If I get involved in a pissing match with the U.S. Army at war. So thanks, but no thanks. We're not going to put out that estimate. Valid, though it may be. My God. We had one very prestigious member of the Board of National Estimates who accompanied us down the corridor after that session with Director Helms. He turned to Sam Adams, my colleague, who was responsible for digging up those figures, ferreting them out, and creating an honest estimate of what we call the order of battle. He turned to Sam and he said, well, now, Sam, have we... Have we exceeded the bounds of, of a tolerable dishonesty? And Sam, <laughs> I, I had to grab Sam's arm. This is not a joke. This is not tolerable dishonesty. This was intolerable dishonesty. Okay. Well, the upshot was that that was early fall, late summer. Uh, in early 1968, so a few months later, the communists in South Vietnam mounted an all-country offensive called the Tet Offensive because it uh, occurred during the, uh, the, uh, the holiday season of Tet. Late January, early February 1968 now, every town, hamlet, uh, provincial capital, Saigon itself, attacked. How many Viet Cong would it take to do that? 
Well, they couldn't do it with 299,000, that's for sure. They did it with 500, 600,000, okay? So it was a very bloody way to show that we had been right, that Helms had been wrong, but he had protected the agency, okay? So what happens? Well, LBJ comes to his senses and he says, what the, what the hell's going on here, okay? And he finally picks on some old wise men, Clark Clifford. Other people have been around for a while. And he says, hey, let's have a little conference of wise men here. What do we do now? It doesn't look like the American people will be persuaded we could continue this war and win it. And uh, uh, he started discussions with this. And in March of, two, of 1968, right after Tet, okay, the following month, General Westmoreland was back from Saigon, and he said, no problem. Mr. President, if you just put 206,000 more U.S. troops in, in, in Vietnam, we can go up, clear out Laos and Cambodia, go up through North Vietnam, and we'll, we, we, can, we, we can handle this thing. That's what I want, 206,000 troops, okay? Well, guess what? On the 9th of March, somebody pretty high in the Pentagon, we know who it is now. It was Les Gelb since defeat, since deceased. He leaked Westmoreland's plan to the New York Times, Phil Sheen. Okay. Front page Westmoreland wants 206,000 more troops. This is hotly disputed in the administration. Oh my God. It's leaked, okay? What happens next? Another another patriotic leaker, I'll tell you his name in a second, says, my God. Okay, so Westmoreland's request has been leaked. <clears throat> somebody leaked. Somebody has to leak the accurate CIA numbers. Sam Adams, my former colleague's numbers. And so he does. What is it, uh, about nine days later, New York Times had CIA figures on enemy strength in Vietnam disputed by the army turned out to have been right. Okay. Who leaked that? His name was Dan Ellsberg. It was his first leak. He never had leaked anything like that before. He didn't know who had leaked the earlier figures, but he said, that guy's a patriot. I'm going to follow suit. So, Westmoreland's plans are divulged. Uh, uh, Sam Adams' figures are also divulged. The same people, uh, Neil Sheehan on the New York Times. I mean, New York Times used to <clears throat> print these things if they were documentary or if they came from people who they, they trusted, trust again. So what happens? Well, when this meeting of wise men in those days, apparently there were no wise women. Anyhow, wise men got together, okay? And LBJ says, my God, those leaks, those damn leaks have cost us. We can't prosecute this war. Um, you know, I was going to give, this is documentary now, LBJ, I was going to give Westmoreland those 206,000 troops to go in up to maybe even threaten the Chinese border, show there's Chinese, what we mean, right? What happened last time we did that, huh? Korea, remember that? Okay. So he says, I was gonna give him those troops, but now I can't, I can't do that. The law is war, the, the war is lost. Um, what are we gonna do? And so the wise men say, yeah, uh, we're sorry that you were misled. Sorry, but you're right. The war is lost. We can't continue. Um, and what LBJ chooses to do with Bobby Kennedy and others winning big in uh, New Hampshire, 
polls and sort of coming into their own on an anti-war platform. LBJ looks at the writing on the wall, handwriting on the wall, and he says, okay, uh, I'm going to go on TV. And he goes on TV, I remember it very distinctly, on the 31st of March, and he says, all right, uh, we have decided uh, that we are going to go to negotiations. You hear that? We're going to go to negotiations to resolve this war. I'm going to call a bombing halt as of today. And I have decided not to run for re-election. Okay. Now, um, we have the analogy. We have Ukraine. We have Biden who I fear is not as alert mentally as LBJ, but at least, at least we have some advisors that should have learned something by now. They should know that what they were told by the head of the CIA and the head of the national intelligence set up and, and everybody else that Putin had lost this war was 180 degrees wrong, not 360 degrees wrong, like, like buy a book, which sort of another thing, uh, but 180 degrees wrong. And what are they going to do? And again, my fearful conclusion is they have nothing other than to say, okay, we do what LBG did, LBJ did. And maybe even Biden, you could say, um, you have to spend more time. Yeah, you have to spend more time with your son Hunter because he needs your support right now. You have to spend more time with your family and you are, you know, getting up there. And so maybe you don't run for re-election anymore, okay? Well, even if that doesn't happen, for God's sake, you go to negotiations. You go to a bombing halt. You don't reinforce. You don't send F-16s and even more powerful weapons. So, yeah, it, it helps sometimes to be a, to have been around for a while, I see a direct analogy there. Whether whether Biden can be persuaded to do the sensible thing without any wise men around him, without any wise women around him, not fully in control of his capabilities here, not fully compass mentis. I don't know, but this season we need to we need to sort of not only hope, but we need to, to pray that this happens and that nothing worse happens in the way of escalation. That's a bleak outlook, but uh, I don't know. It seems to me we, we need to have we need to have hope. Is there no hope in your opinion? <laughs> you know, there's always hope. Um, who was it? I think it was Augustine that said, Hope has two daughters. One of them was courage. I wrote it down somewhere here when we were talking before. Yeah. There are two daughters to hope, anger and courage. Okay. Now, Anger, you know, I'll give you a for instance, as we used to say in the Bronx, when I saw my colleagues deliberately falsify intelligence to justify, in quotes, a war on Iraq, I got really angry. I was so angry, I, could, I was livid, okay? And luckily, I remembered something I learned, learned at Fordham University, and that was that Thomas Aquinas, we had to study a lot of Thomas Aquinas back then. Uh, he was bad on some things like women, but he was good on other things like Aristotle and virtue. And he said that virtue was just enough of what you need, that anger can be considered a virtue, okay? Just like courage, you know? Uh, anger, like courage is in the middle, okay? Too much courage, Oh, there was a Latin word for that, yedacundia, you know, just really kind of 
and too little courage, Mr. White, you know, just timidity, okay? So he tried to describe what he called the virtue of courage. And he said, it's just enough anger, the virtue of anger, I should say. And he couldn't find any Latin word for the virtue of anger. So he went to John, went back to John Chrysostom of the fourth century, for God's sake. And Chrysostom said, and Thomas quoted him, uh, anger respicit bonum justitiae. Um, anger looks at the good of justice. And if you can live amid injustice without anger, you are unjust, you sin, and you are not practicing the virtue of anger. Anger is just enough courage what you need. So that made me feel, wow, that made me feel pretty good. And then I thought about Augustine, yeah, the twin daughters of, of, uh, of hope would be hope itself and courage. And then, you know, there's one other aspect here that I would bring from my, from my faith heritage uh, as a hopeful thing is the three theological virtues, faith, hope, again, and love. And as we all know, Paul at least said the greatest of these is love. Now, how does that work into this equation? Well, it seems to me that we have to kind of summon up, uh, summon up the courage to love our neighbor. Whoa, is that hard? That sure is hard. But when you enter into negotiations like this, you can't feel indispensable or exceptional. You have to feel some love, I dare say, some respect for the other side. And so do I have hope? Yeah, I have, I have hope galore. And with respect to Easter, well, I worship in an African-American church. We have an incredible pastor, an incredible sermon giver. And what he says was this. I'll try to imitate it as best I can. All these things, Gethsemane, crucifixion, his friends running away. That was Friday. That was Friday. But we believe Sunday's coming. Sunday's coming. Now, <laughs> Sunday is just one day away. And uh, when I think of Sunday, I have outgrown my old thinking that I was taught as a boy that the proof that Christ is alive is not the rock, <laughs> is not the empty tomb, the rock from the, I don't know if that happened or not. I don't care. What happens is I could see Christ alive today in my friends and people who are, who are fighting for justice in you, Nima, and the people who might be listening to us, okay? That's where the resurrection is. And does that give me hope? It sure as hell does. <laughs> Pardon my French here. But it gives me a lot of hope. And I think that we have to be human and we have to hope. And I think we have to remember that the greatest of these, greatest of these virtues far above anger and courage and hope is love. And uh, that's my take on hope, Nima. Thanks for asking.